What I'm here to tell you about today will probably start by sounding very miserable and sad, but hopefully by the end, it will be a deep sense of hope that permeates through what I'm saying. I'm here to talk about politics, not the type that makes you shiver, that is insincere, that hates, but the type that is fair, that is kind, that is just, that is supposed to create a future that is sustainable to all of us. I am queer, and I've found a purpose in politics, despite living in a society that would rather have me elsewhere. Today, we're going to focus on power, leadership, and emotions. I'm going to tell you why speaking from the margin is a radical act of vulnerability and power, why I believe we have a common cause, why I believe you have as much right to, de to determine your future and our society future than those who try to deny you that right. We've heard it many times over in all feminist thinking, the personal is political and all politics are personal. But how come do we have such an estranged relationship with politics and power? Why are we so afraid to talk about power? Where has this idea, democratic idea, of power to the people gone? Why do we live in a world in which wealth is above justice, in which politics are above integrity, in which profits are above lives? Maybe we need to be remembered of our shared humanity more often. By the end, I want us all to agree that we can focus on power without putting the emphasis on strength, but on kindness. But first, let's go back in time. My personal story has always been political. I was born prematurely, three months early to be exact, at a time where science could not guarantee my survival. A year later, I was diagnosed with cancer. I spent most of, the year, most of the year 97 at hospital where I learned to walk, where I spoke my first words, where my body learned about resilience and power. Growing up, nothing about, we were, nothing about me was conventional either. I was a quirky little child who didn't know that his rights would be violated because of his sexual orientation, that he didn't know that the emotion he would get most accustomed to would be fear that his security would be undermined because of his gender expression. A little child who kept on rethinking the course of reality society wanted to impose on him. I'm not going to lie today. It was awfully difficult. I spent most of my teenage years suffering. I had no room of my own, no defined identity, no role models, and discrimination was also part of my daily life. I was used, played with, laughed at, used again, and sexually abused. The treatment I received was cruel, and yet here I was, resilient. These were all the consequences of rejection and silence, mine and other people's, of society's desire to suppress my reality as it usually does with people who belong in the margins. You might be wondering why all of this relates to politics. Well, it seemed to be the only way I had available to take my power back. Once I understood that my mere existence and my sufferings were political, then suddenly I saw and I made a promise to myself that I would do everything that I could and raise my voice so that people would not have to go through what I had to endure. That I would not let anyone define who I am or what I stand for and never be silenced ever again. I'm an ecofeminist. What it means politically is that my belief system and the values that derive from it are deeply rooted in my personal experience, using intersectionality as the main tool and perspective to destroy the glass ceiling that marginalized people hit their head against so often. Ecofeminism made breakthrough research on the general, theory, general system theory. It is the scientific proof that each element of ourselves, from the smallest cell in our body to our most complicated power relationship, are actually part of a vaster pattern, a pattern that connects and evolves through complicated, interwoven interactions and principles. My greatest inspiration, Gisèle Halimi, once said that her freedom was only meaningful if it served to free others. Together with the Oak Feminist Principles, it means that we are part of the collective, and the collective ourselves. Before talking about power and leadership, I ought to define those concepts. Power is defined as one's capacity to be able to act or decide to affect a certain outcome. And according to Eric, to Eric Liu, there can be several sources of power. Physical strength, numbers or the power of crowds, social norms or what, ex what is considered acceptable, the rule of the law or, so, or um, state action, and emotions 
or the capacity to influence someone's action or thinking. Leadership, on the other hand, is defined as one's ability to rile out oneself and others around them behind an idea or a cause. Power, as we conceptually know it, has come to be identified with domination. Power means power over. According to such a view, power is a zero-sum game. The more you have, the less I have. But according to an ecofeminist perspective, this patriarchal version of power couldn't be more inaccurate and dysfunctional. In fact, power m works way more reliably and organically from the bottom up than from the top down. Far from being identified with invulnerability, strength, or emotion suppression, power requires exactly the opposite, vulnerability, empathy, and a readiness to change. In a nutshell, it means wielding power with ra rather than power over. Power is not owned. It is constantly reproduced and exchanged through relationships. Power is given to us and can be taken back. Real power enhances the power of others. Real power is empathetic and vulnerable. One of the core assumptions of democratic theory is that emotions is that political sphere is entirely deprived of emotions. In fact, in order to be respected, it must be ruled by reason only. But according to many social scientists like Eva Illuz, we agree to disagree. In fact, emotions are deeply rooted within politics. Political life induces a whole structure of feeling and helps to shape, together with the media and the educational system, shared ways of thinking and feeling about specific social experiences. It is the narratives used, shaped by the political elite, that creates and influence opinions, choices, and behaviors on the population that consumes them. In a nutshell, emotions have a multifaceted power to deny or verify the factual evidence, to motivate action, or to respond to concrete situations. They create stories, stories that do not need to be true, nor factual, but just need to have a whiff of truth. The conservative political discourse relies on three emotions, fear, disgust, and resentment, all of which are targeted to ma at marginalized people that challenge the social order of the world. Take wokeness, for example. Generally speaking, it means being aware of systems of power and violence and knowing how your privileges intersect with the people around you. Wokeness is a well-honed political and conceptual weapon wielded by the conservative power and people and demonizes anyone who recognizes the systemic nature of violence in our society. In short, it, is, it means that it is the oppressor who gets to define the oppression. This would make as much sense as if we let men define sexism or white people define racism. There is sadly nothing new in painting marginalized people as a threat to the established order, especially in times of political and economic crisis. Those who defend the social order of the world are simply looking for a scapegoat, as history has shown. Building a political agenda on fear spearheads the idea that recognizing fundamental rights to entire population takes away from others. But this couldn't be more wrong. The gap between those who are accused of being woke and those who accuse them has never been greater. On the one hand, we have masculinists, transphobes, homophobes, racists, who are more radicalized than ever. And on the other hand, radical social justice activists seem to be unable to reach out to others that disagree with them. There's no one to blame for this situation, because I believe we entirely lost connection. We've lost connection, and we seem to get lost in the midst of extremes that are not sustainable for any of us. So reason has never been opposed to emotion. In fact, it's just the emotions that have been specifically chosen for a political and self-serving purpose. We're allowing emotions to be the preserve of a political class that has become greedy with power. Power being defined as being assertive, fearless, and strong. But what if all of this was wrong? What if being powerful meant being empathetic? Audre Lorde once said that the master's tool will not dismantle the master's house. So if the patriarchal house we live in has been built with emotions like fear and power being defined as being strong, wouldn't doing the exact opposite tear it down? 
If we want to radically transform our communities, it is time for us all to step out of line and into the arena. To stop waiting for power to be given to us, but take things into our own hands. I don't care what they have to say about me. This is who I am. The fearful and the joyous, the good and the bad, the beauty and the mess, the emotional. This is all I've been ashamed of, always, and all I've always, always been asked to suppress. But this has got to change, because it's time for me to take my narrative back. So what if I want to have power? There's going to be no change of power structure and paradigm if we do not take our narratives back and complexifying our, reali our realities. They want to simplify and vilify us. They want to separate us because they know that together we are stronger. So let's be smarter here. Today, we have the tools to understand and define ourselves. History and justice have shown and have recognized the rights we enjoy today that our predecessors fought for. We had the right to manifest, to run for office, to hope for a better future, for a fairer future, to self-determination. However, in order for this to happen, we as oppressed communities need to respect each other. We need to gain security in ourselves and to respect each other's identities and postures while aiming for the same goals. I can't begin to tell you how many times I've been insulted and questioned by trans, non-binary, queer people and women saying, say, telling me that I was not discriminated enough, that I was not suffering enough, that I was too femme, too mass, too queer, not trans enough. And this to me was the greatest burden, being silenced and held back by the people I so badly wanted to protect and defend. What is it we have to do in order to reach and be respected on both sides of the aisle? Because I know that we can do great things when we root for each other's rise. You want to change your power structures and become a leader in your own field but don't know how? By building trust. We had great examples of female leaders in the last decade perfectly exemplifying this entire talk. They knew how to build communities, whether marginalized or not, and valued integrity, humanity and kindness. And they've proved their worthiness of this trust up to the very end, going when it was time to go. We who are in the room need to make room. We who are at the table need to pull up a chair for others. If the goal truly is redefining power structures, to open it to a vast range of people and emotions instead of wielding fear to better lead, togetherness will truly be the major fuel in our tank. But how do we build trust? We deliver, over and over and over again. When wanting to build trust, we have to understand what people value through constant engagement and care. And once we understand that, we can set ourselves to, de to deliver. Personally, I want to make that change in opening in politics. I want to build trust for those that look like me and those who don't, but are willing to hear me out. I'll forever stand by that, and I'll hope that in the future, I'll be held accountable with honest feedback so that I'll forever know my privileges and the, and the people who helped me get to where I've always dreamed of being. I am ambitious. I am an overachiever. Not because I think highly of myself, no, but because I've never been recognized in the places I thought I belonged into. Because I was queer, because I was different, because I was deemed powerless when actually I was more powerful than ever because I was drawing my power from my vulnerability and my difference. Starting this political career makes sense. Wanting to be elected by the people and for the people makes sense. So for the first time in my life, I'm discovering that I'm no longer being the object, but the subject. That I'm no longer, that, I'm, that I can too be strong, that I too can be powerful, that I too can be of service and of substance, that I too deserve a seat at the table. That I too can defend what's right and what's just. I'm also discovering that those who seek to destroy me haven't taken everything away from me. That I can redefine this, but the political class that, has been reflecting, that hasn't been reflecting people's richness and diversity and build back the bridges they've been wanting to take down between us for years. If we're going to find our way back to each other, Vulnerability is going to be the path. As I said before, vulnerability is the greatest form of courage. 
Courage to love yourself and others in a world that only encourages detachment. Courage to offer yourself freedom because it's giving the opportunity around to the people around you to do the same. We need to change what us mean. Instead of trying to, instead of seeking to define community by self-interest, we might want to seek to define it through concepts we consider universal. Jacinda Erdern once said, what if we see ourselves through, through what we value, humanity, kindness, and a profound sense of connection to each other? A belief that we are guardians, not only of our home and planet, but of each other. Those words resonated so deeply in my heart and in my head while prepping for this talk, making this path even more clear and natural, and allowing me to powerfully assert today in front of you, if not me, who? If not now, when? Thank you.